Chapter 3 The Dream of Destiny Zania lost consciousness on the long flight through the ice-cold air over the Pangean Ocean. She had travelled far from the island of Kirichu to the kingdom of Galeria, only to awake to the shrieks and cries of other prisoners. What is this? Where am I? She found herself in a dank prison cell. She tried to speak and utter, Marlon, only to discover that a gag had been crammed into her mouth, stretching her jaw painfully wide. A sharp pain in her shoulders called attention to the fact that she was hanging by her wrists to a chain mounted in the concrete ceiling. Her ankles were shackled to the damp floor. Twisting, her only relief was to discover that Marlon was indeed next to her, sadly trussed and suspended in a like manner to herself. His eyes were wide and alert. Seeing her awake, there was a flicker of joy in them. Watching her, he managed a smile, despite his gag, glad to know that she was alive. She tried to smile back, but her body sagged against her chains. She felt the pain of defeat. In the present situation, she could not imagine how she would ever see Marlon grow tall. She thought sadly of how she and Juratan had dreamt of seeing all the girls run after him. Juratan. Remembering Juratan's murder, Zania let loose a grief-stricken moan that could not be stifled by the gag in her mouth. The weight of her grief was more painful than any chains. How could she accept that her dear husband was gone? If she did, what was left to believe in? We have to escape, she thought. Taking a deep breath, Zania tested the chain holding her up. Tugging violently, the links held. In a frenzy of frustration and anger, she pulled on it again and again, but her only reward was her blood, as her wrists bled from her efforts. Breathless, she went limp, and stared at her bonds with pleading eyes. If we can't escape, she shied away, and could not bear to dwell on such a thought. Pensive and perplexed, her sores crusted over enough that she once again risked pulling on the chain that held her. But before she did, a deep din startled her. She heard a latch being lifted, and the doors on the other side of the chamber swung open on creaking hinges. She fixed her eyes on the opening, and through the door came a guard clad in galleonic armour. Good! You have awoke! he barked. Then he narrowed his evil eyes, and went and turned a turbine that gradually opened the ceiling. Looking up, Zania saw that a giant, chilling creature was crawling towards them. She imagined herself in the belly of the beast, as she discerned by the light of the torch in her cell that a dragon was descending. Both Zania and Marlon moaned, and began to thrash like hooked fish, as they thought that they were going to be eaten alive, that this was how they would be put to death. Reaching the ground, the dragon advanced and tasted the air before them with its forked tongue. Its unbearable carrion breath choked all hope from their hearts, but Zania soon realised that it was here to transport them somewhere else, as the guard used a sharp bayonet to prod her and Marlon into a cage mounted on the back of the beast. After locking the door, the dragon crouched and unfolded its huge wings. The thin membranes thrummed as they rushed upwards. They hung there for an instant, looking like two translucent sails. The dragon drove them down, and with a mighty whoosh, it was flung upwards. The air whipped past Zania, snatching her breath away. With three smooth strokes of its wings, they were in the sky, climbing rapidly. The sunlight blinded both mother and son. When Zania's eyes had become accustomed to the brightness, she immediately pulled the gag out of Marlon's mouth and hugged and kissed him many times. As the dragon rose higher, 
she was able to get a view of where they had been imprisoned. She saw that it was a fortress fashioned like a honeycomb, protectively positioned on an island in the middle of a lava lake, and surrounded on all angles by dunes that would dwarf most mountains. They spread to the horizon, like ripples on an ocean. Zania shook her head, realising that she'd been mad to think she even stood a chance of escape. It was barren and forbidding. Everything about the place was in stark contrast to the colourful, lushly vegetated island of Kirachu. The white-plumed beast swept its tail to correct its course, turning southwards, away from that dreary wasteland, and towards a completely different landscape. Straining its wings, the land sped past as if it were being pulled out from under them. Before long, a golden, silverish structure cracked the skyline by painting the horizon with what seemed to be turrets upon turrets. Although Zani had never been away from Dicentia before, she knew, based on what her late husband had told her, that this city was the land of Galeria's capital, named after Galaroth's father himself, Gal Gangstinople. At first appearance, and even upon further examination, it appeared to have been built from the outside in, with smaller structures on the periphery, and the architecture getting higher and more grandiose as it encroached upon the centre of the city. Every building was embellished with statues and scrollwork. Every available plot of land had been built upon, which explained the height of the towers. The sky was the only space left. There were towers built on top of towers, it seemed, with the highest structures connecting with each other by a network of bridges. Even in her pain, Zania looked at it in amazement, never having seen anything like it in her life. As they flew closer, she could see that the immense towers were strangled by canyons of clouds and thick mats of moss and ivy towers so huge that their crowns were pyramidical towns entrenched into the ground by pillars of pearl sculpted into the likes of galleonic paladins, each one standing fifty feet high, proudly bearing the weight of these glorious citadels that had windows that were as tall and as wide as castle gates, doors like the mouths of underground caverns, and walls that were as threatening as the faces of cliffs. It was impressive, but frightening, and Zania's blood went cold, as she considered being taken to the very heart of Galgangstinople, to the tallest tower of all, a tower that she guessed was at least one thousand stories tall, as its five flagged spires stabbed the sky and bled gothic grandeur. Drawing ever closer, the finer details of this stunning structure gained more definition, and as a result pierced the piety of even a dignified Dicentian like herself, and, for a moment, made her want to be Queen of Galeria. Such was the magnitude of the mansion, and how heart-corrupting it was. The smallest spire was crowned with three golden colosseums, stacked on top of one another like a tiered fountain, and the spire was not at all plain. Everything was elaborated and symmetrical, and the crowning colosseum was coroneted with a carouse club, surrounded by a maze of a most potent herb, with fruit trees and honey-spewing springs. Zania could almost hear the music Galaroth must play when he dances on this stage in the sky, under the starlight. This was certainly a palace from paradise itself, and it seemed to Zania that the only way in or out was via the sky. She had to remember that her visit was not worthy of awe or respect. She was being brought as a prisoner, worse a prisoner of the one who had murdered her husband and love. She steeled herself for what was to come, and she was resolute that she had to appear before Galaroth in the fullness of her strength and beauty. The white dragon dived down with its wings outspread, 
parachuting onto a red carpet through an opening at the top of the tower, and landed on its rear legs in King Galaroth's throne chamber. Its powerful muscles rippled as they absorbed the shock of impact. It then dropped to all fours and skipped a step to keep its balance. Hemmed in by hulking cherry and apricot trees at the far end of the open hallway, the wicked, wizardly warrior king was waiting there, impatient and in the midst of a living orchestra, as little singing birds, bears, badgers, rabbits, wolves, stags, squirrels and stoats, foxes and frogs, toads and tortoises, with shells in the shapes of castles inhabited by treelings, amused him while he stroked the hair of a royal who rested her head on his left knee. Reclining upon a golden throne, Encrusted with rubies, emeralds, diamonds, and sapphires, Galaroth was flanked by two guards, each holding a halberd-like staff adorned with a double-headed axe. His feet rested on the statue of a golden eagle poised to take flight, a similar statue to the one cresting the tower's topmost spire. Its tail feathers so expertly crafted that this could have been a real creature dipped in liquid gold, shaded the throne where he awaited his prisoners. Galaroth opened the cage without touching it, a mere flick of his fingers, and the door was ajar. Zarnia had heard of such sorcerers, who possessed that kind of mind might, and this was the second time she had seen it performed. She knew she was in the presence of a frightening power, but she was determined to exhibit the grace and courage of a queen. She hugged Marlon and whispered in his ear for him not to worry. Then she stood, still and silent, inside the cage, waiting for the guards to drag her out, which is exactly what the four guards did, tearing Marlon from her arms and then forcing her to her knees before their king. She tumbled forward on the white marble floor, close enough for Galaroth to lean forward and grab her by the hair. <laughs> Welcome to Dynasty Towers. Long has it been since a guest as distinguished as yourself has graced us with their presence. My mind has been occupied elsewhere, but I assure you, from now on, I shall not neglect my duties as host. His voice was low, rich and beguilingly commanding. It seemed to kiss her skin like a soft breeze enticing her. Her skin crawled, realizing that despite his devilish deeds, the seductive lilt in his voice made her desire him as a friend. His manner was much different than the man who roared as he took Joratan's life, engrossed in the thought of how to conquer the heart of this monster. Zarnia felt the weight of doom and destiny descend upon her. She struggled to lift her heart and put up an honourable fight. Do not speak to me with that foul tongue of yours, Galaroth. It is not fit to utter my name. From whence did such courage come? Her grief, her love for her husband and son. It does not matter that my husband is gone. The gods will come for you, to avenge his death and my capture. Oh, your gods will come for me, you say. Come for me. With what army? An army of angels, Galaroth chuckled. <laughs> An army of angels, ah, how I would love to see that. But the thing is, Zania, your gods would not dare to defy my will. <laughs> he said, mocking her. Then his eyes narrowed, and his voice took on a sharp, threatening quality. You would be wise to unbend your pride and pledge your fealty to me. He said, There is no virtue or use in you defending the whereabouts of 
the blade. She looked him in the eye. And why is that? He smiled cruelly. Oh, I forgot. You have probably forgotten in your frustration. Well, it's a bit of a sad story, really. You see, when the blade dissolved into the wind, I was left with nine precious stones. When I returned to my tower, I erroneously thought that if I forged a blade, maybe I could harness the power myself, but sadly, after ample toil, I remained unsuccessful. Oh, it was not for want of trying, I assure you. In the end, disgusted, I threw them all into a lava pit. But you know what? They were unscathed. They floated back up as if to mock me. If I could not destroy them, I could at least ensure that no one else got them. So I compromised. I have placed one in each of my fortresses, situated in the many hearts of my empire. He narrowed his eyes and stared at her. And I can assure you that like the stones are indestructible, my nine fortresses are impregnable. Zania was stunned by this news, but she remained erect and strong, unwilling to have this evil Galaroth know just how devastating this news was to her. Only a slight tremor betrayed her true emotions and fear. She understood the futility of bargaining with him. She intuited that her only leverage was to play against his ego, to diminish his sense of his own greatness. She uttered a quick silent prayer, and then, with her husband's burnt body in mind, she flashed angry eyes at him and slowed her speech so each word struck like a hammer blow and carried all the weight of her dignity, station, and anger. "'You're not such a mighty thing,' she began, her voice dripping with disdain. "'Of course you believe you are, because you now have the nine elements in your possession.' <laughs> she shrugged. "'You think you have power, because your throne sits on top of this tower. But you are not even a gnat before God. She held his gaze now. If you could only smell the stench of the underworld, if you could but witness the grievous penalties that await you, you would never, ever trade the afterlife for this one, for you would understand, conclude, that it is like giving up the kingship of an eternal empire to be a miserable momentary peasant to demonic desires. It is like giving up boundless bliss for a second of stardom, which in contrast to the divine delights awaiting us is a second of sorrow. You would choose to live a trillion years as a dung beetle rather than face what awaits you, Galaroth. But even after a trillion years, all this, she said, sweeping her arms across the panorama of the court, would be as the blink of an eye. Galaroth held his rage at this impudent outburst in check. He sank deep in his throne. His breathing was an ugly rasp. Zania watched him closely. Even from where she stood, she could smell that his breath was heavy with dragon's blood. Perhaps, she feared, he was too drunk to take in what she was saying. Perhaps he was too drunk to care. Either way, she felt she had to go on. Why are you dying to live when you are just living to die? At the end of time, the gods promised the lowliest of low, a land ten times the size of this world, Galaroth. Ten times! There are tracts of terrain that are still left unexplored on this puny pebble we call Earth. So just imagine what ten times must be. Imagine what abode Lord Trinigan Apocalypse has prepared for the pious and the prophets, let alone the lowliest of low. She shrugged her shoulders. There are times I pity rulers who have the insolence to believe that they will still possess all that they own when they die. She laughed a soft 
a mocking laugh. <laughs> For myself, I practice what I preach. I bartered blood and my wedding jewellery to cure my sick neighbour. I sold six urns to rescue a fellow sister drowning in debt. I donated my dowry, my dowry, to a diseased dissentient for the sake of the divine. Now you must be thinking that I have a heart of gold, she said, keeping her eyes on Galaroth. She shook her head. I don't have a heart of gold, Galaroth. Trust me, I pity the altruistic, but what I do have is a heart of understanding. That is what I have, the understanding that the sky is not the limit. Yes, the sky is not the limit, and if it is, the sun shall fall on me. This is God's promise. We have our own worlds waiting, where every little thing we do will be epic. And yet you still think you're a king. She shook her head appalled. You think you're rich? <laughs> well, you are poor. You think you're dressed? You're naked. You think you're high? <laughs> you are low. You think your stomach's full, it's empty. The truth of the matter is that you're no King Galaroth. You never were, nor ever will be. Not if you continue upon the path you are on. <laughs> she laughed again. I am royalty, you see. I am an empress in exile. I patiently humble myself and sacrifice everything I love in this life and sizzle in suspense to be crowned a queen in the next. You see, we should all heed well that the more you love something, the sweeter it is to sacrifice in the name of the divine. And that success, as well as judgment, does not depend on material gains in this world, but how you earn the means for your material wealth. Wealth is no sin, but how you acquired your wealth can be. You could drink an entire ocean of dragon's blood, and the angels will sing your praise. Sing your praise. If you broke your back to earn that ocean of blood. But if you broke a brother's by slavery, then woe to you when you come to judgment. Galaroth had had enough of Zania's sermon. Nonsense, you thorn! He bellowed, glowering at her through bloodshot eyes. He belched and smiled. Is that it, then? Is your cursed sermon over? He clicked his fat tongue in disgust. That dungeon has made you delirious. You keep on repeating the same things, but in different words. Do you not? Do you not? Eternity, eternity. If only I could smell the stench of hell. I am hell, and to my knowledge I smell pretty good. Ten times. If there's a world waiting for you, then why are you still here? Why not? Simply die. Go on. He dared her. Jump off this tower. That is if you are woman enough ten times. Go and lecture the dissentient delinquents who get drunk and whisper like weasels in corners. Teach them how to tame time. And you talk about success. <laughs> I am the epitome of success, so regret you ever imposed your petty sermon on me. Your sermon has no standing in a society as this, for it is a jungle up there, Zania. The streets a jungle, and I came out mightier than a dragon, and I am not talking about the rotten streets down there. I am talking about the stone streets of the Senator's Circle up here. To win one must fight, one must roar, one must conquer. 
and in all my years as sovereign of this state I have learned but one thing, and that is that this whole kingship business is a business where everyone is out to mess everyone over. Oh, and how I messed everyone over. I am but twenty-three, and I have this building beneath my feet, and I have seen a lot of things in my life. But never before has there been one like me. Enough with your foolish piety. You know and I know that the whole world wants to be me. And do you want to know why? Because I tower taller than most Galerians, have the eyes of a falcon and features so fantastic, my face is fabled. What's more, I have the mind of an architect and a voice like that of an angel's. And, he added, although it wasn't necessary, I am more devious than the demons themselves, for every hamlet I quake, every pulpit I take, I leave a smoking crater in my wake. So, foolish woman, respect me. I have earned my throne. I have murdered my mother, my father, even my entire family, and my ascension to the throne was not political intrigue, but brutality. Bloody! I engineered an empire at the tender age of sixteen. My father simply laid the foundations, and I, I rolled the dice with death and won, and hustled as if there's no hell. For I crushed kingdoms, and devised the death of a dozen dynasties, and in due course I bloody well cooed my way to the top. Oh, I worked. I worked. I bled, I suffered, I made history for the filth I did. And my feats would leave the angels themselves in awe of this monster, your god allowed to flourish. I have worked, he said, leaning forward, worked my crown off, and now you have the audacity to come before me and fracture the very fibre of my existence by lecturing me about piety, about success and the world to come. You tell me to feed the poor. I'll feed them my foot, and I'll be generous as well because they won't have to buy the vinegar. Zania laughed. <laughs> Worked your crown off. You might convince yourself, but not me. You inherited your wealth and your power. His eyes glistened. Ah, but consider what I did for my inheritance, he said. I framed my own mother for kicking my father off this very tower. Now, if that's not working my crown off, I don't know what it is. Now, he went on, pointing an angry finger at her, do not ever talk to me about death, darling. Do not ever dare to talk to me about death. I don't plan on dying any time soon. As a matter of fact, I don't even know if. I'm going to die. And even if I do, who knows? Maybe I'm coming back. Maybe medicine will progress to such an extent that it'll solve the whole issue of death. And believe me, I'm working on it. I'm funding the field of chemistry. Chemistry is so sophisticated these days that I believe my army of alchemists and warlocks are on the precipice of achieving the new Galeonic goal. The goal to see death die. Yes, the death of death. What a sight that would be. We don't have to die. We have enough gold in the coffers. We don't even have to die. The point I'm trying to make, Zania, is that you cannot be pious and be successful, and I have no interest in piety 
if that is the choice. You see, my four, four, forefathers were pious, so pious that they envied the angels, but the desert made them pant like dogs. But if you're ruthless, like me, you make the desert itself pant like a dog. So who's the successful, the meek or the malicious? Do you really think I want to hurt the humble? Do you really think I want to murder the munificent? No. I merely want to feast on the fear in their eyes. I want them to squirm and beg for their little lives. <laughs> Is that really so wrong, Zania? I do not think so. I do not think so because you're trying to say that even though I have the known world perched on the tip of my index finger, I won't spin it. I won't spin it. I won't spin it. Are you mad? Are you mad, Zania? Mad enough to think that I would leave living every man's dream and fear the gods no soul has ever laid eyes on. Every man's dream? she asked, challenging him. Do you really want to know? This, he proclaimed, wobbling to his feet before sitting back down. All this, this is every man's dream, and especially this titanic tower that makes me toss my head like an eagle even when I'm not drunk. And do you want to know why? Every floor is a hectare high, and one hundred hectares wide on all sides. Every floor is like a world on its own. Every floor makes my heart pump my blood faster than the wings of a bee, as I play hide-and-seek and slalom through the skyline while riding a dragon and admiring the architecture that's so fine it would make your eyes bleed. This... My dear Zania is every man's dream to be able to make a call, one call, and in one click have an entire army. No, an armada crowding at your doorstep like a legion of dogs, just waiting for you to say, seize. That is, after executing a speech and concluding it with a wink that makes the heart of an entire nation leap. <laughs> he laughed. Do you not understand, Zania? It is every man's dream to star in his very own spectacle, and that is exactly what I am doing. <laughs> he chortled. I am seething in one, and I am supposed to worship the gods. What did they ever do for me? Other than filling my body with blood, all they gave me was grief. Galaroth gloated, so bloated in his ego, that he did not comprehend the extent of his ludicrous lies. Would you ever abandon such a position for some make-believe, promised paradise? <laughs> he snorted. I didn't think so. You think you understand me, don't you, Zania? You think I am a hazehead, a deluded drunk? Yes, I can see in your eyes that is what you think. You think I am no different than any other tyrant. But you are wrong. I am not deluded. I know exactly what I am doing, and I know exactly where I am going, and forget burning a billion years. To keep this crown on my head, I am prepared to blow and reform until time without end ends. And you want to know what else? I don't care. I don't care, Zania. I just don't. Care. He sat back, and his chest heaved in and out with the exertion of his emotion. He eyed Zania closely as he lifted a solid gold toothpick and began to poke at his teeth. 
I really do not understand why people like you submit your soul so assiduously to the covenant of the gods that exist only in your imagination. <laughs> he laughed. To tell you the truth, there is a part of me that longs to die and see your so-called gods. For in my opinion, Zania, it is illogical for your gods to even exist. For who created them, and from when were they there? So, he went on after a moment, I would advise you to accept your destiny. He smiled, a lascivious and horrible smile. I am sure you know that from the moment I laid my imperial eyes on you, I wanted to make you mine. You were a fool to wed Juritan, whom I defeated with exceptional ease, and for whom I would advise not to waste another precious moment fretting over. What was he? A wizard? <laughs> Hardly. More like a fool, and a weak one at that, to create a blade he could not even lift. Galaroth shrugged. But what is past is past. It is only the future that matters now. So I ask you with all due respect, Zania, forget your son. Forget your spouse. Forget your world. And come into mine. It is a magnificent world. If only because I rule it. He smiled then, a smile that was so hideous that it made her want to turn away. All you have to do, he said, all you have to do is tell me where the blade is, and everything of mine is yours. <laughs> and above all else, embracing me on this apex, this castle in the clouds, will give you the honour of bearing the heir to my throne in your womb. Galaroth then picked a fruit from a tree, and said, Here, have a bite. Zania had heard as much as she could stand, Facing him, she crossed her arms, and eyed the fruit he extended toward her. "'It is no doubt poisoned,' she pronounced firmly. "'As for your offer, I have no doubt that my womb will rot and die in my body, if I were to burden it with your sordid seed. You dirty demon! How dare you ask me for my hand in marriage? I'm probably older than your mother!' And how dare you degrade the dominion of the divine with your way of life? And you call this paradise? <laughs> it is no paradise. It is hell on earth. Paradise, the real paradise, has far greater delights than what you're offering me. And you are arrogant, Galaroth. Too arrogant to accept the fact that the gods are beyond our mere mortal understanding. You ask, when were they there? They were there when time itself was born. They created time. They taught it how fast to go, and not to ever tarry for the likes of men. So if you are the wise wizard that you claim to be, then surely you would be prepared to blow and reform for the eternal crown that awaits every soul. Not blow and reform for a lowly crown that will inevitably... Perish. Shut up, Galaroth growled. Shut up, shut up. You have lost your mind. It is you who have lost his mind, Zania yelled. And as far as success goes, it seems you have not the slightest idea of what success really is. Only a fool would think that success is counted in mansions, steeds, children or land. Success is having a heart that is content. Are you satisfied, Galaroth? I look at you, 
and I see an unhappy child. You're fidgeting on a throne that crowns the clouds. You're clad in a cape that has enough fleece to clothe twenty paupers. You have a chain around your neck that could easily be the leash of a baby dragon. You have precious stones on every finger that outshine the distant stars. And a crown, a crown that could feed fifty families for fifty thousand years. All very impressive, after a sort. But if that's what you consider success, then you don't know what success is, and you never will. But let me not allow you to wallow in ignorance. Let me admonish you once again. Success is abolishing arrogance, pulverizing pride, eradicating evil, envy, and hatred from your heart. Success is humbling yourself in front of those who otherwise would be humbled. Success is sincerely smiling at the success of others, sacrificing the things you love and praying for the forgiveness of those you loathe. Success is, if it comes down to it, you are satisfied with just two sets of clothes, eating on the floor and genuine worship. Success is having integrity, sharing words of wisdom, avoiding trivial arguments, and softening your soul by wishing for your arch-nemesis to be your comrade in your everlasting abode. Success is dying to die while veiling yourself from vice. Success, success is gazing at God's gorgeous face in your real home, paradise. Galaroth's knuckles whitened as he gripped the cape around himself. She laughed, realising that she was getting under his skin, and thus risked repeating her sermon, but in different words. Did your father never tell you that this life is just an archetype, little more than an experiment devised by the emperor of all entities, and like a smithy who creates new models year after year, God did the same, Galaroth. Why would you think that this is the be-all and end-all? This meagre ball of dirt we call earth is just a divine draught. God has created other worlds, better and bigger worlds, and when his lavish light melts and incinerates the stars of space as a tribute to the initiation of infinity, the righteous will witness his finished product. I see you twitch in discomfort, Galaroth. You know I speak truth. You know there are consequences to your evil. You hide from it, but you know that it must be so. But what I do not know is how you live with yourself, knowing that this little empire of yours will be the— Shut up! Shut up! Shut up! I am tiring of you, you wretch. Tiring of me? What's happened, Galaroth? Just a moment ago you wanted to make me the queen of your empire. Now you cower from me. What's the matter? Not man enough to handle the harsh reality of life? She looked at him with an expression of disgust. You are hopeless, and this life that you are killing for will not last long, Galaroth. It is in its death throes already. And before long, the pleasures you are engaged in will melt away, like snow on a summer day. You stubborn snake, Galaroth sputtered with rage. You dogmatic Dysentian, how dare you speak to me thus? What I offer you will allow you to live better than the gods that you worship. Even a cold, lifeless stone would open its mouth, you daughter of a dumb duck. With his powerful hand, he reached out and grabbed her neck, forcing Zania to gaze beyond him and out through the waterfall flowing behind him. There in the clouds that hovered at eye level, Zania saw that bridges held galerians gliding on chariots pulled by soaring silver-skinned elephants, and every sort of fish from sesingras to whales, squids to rays, and winged rhinos, and other creatures she could hardly describe, let alone name. They appeared to be sailing 
on clouds instead of steel so high in the sky. Even Zania had to concede that there was something spectacularly strange about it, something magical. Even so, it did not enchant her, for there was no grass, no plants, no fields or forests, no bountiful harvests, other than the few floating fields of flowers. None of it was natural. None of it was necessary. Every aspect of this city seemed to be literally drooling extortion, usury and embezzlement from its very paint. It was so prosperous that it was scary, emanating an ephemeral quality. The entire building sent a shiver down her spine. Everything about it was menacing. Her skin swelled with bumps just by looking at the gothic facades of the bullion buildings that seemed to be grinning in the vicinity, as if haughtily swaggering their illegitimate richness. This city was truly a demon's paradise, and Zania was abhorred by it. It was known throughout the world that the kingdom of Galeria had nearly bankrupted itself in order to build this city commissioning golden statues of eagles clutching diamonds the size of dinosaur eggs in their moulded talons, decorating buildings that existed where crops should be grown. Down below, the buildings of Galgangstinople were adorned with hideous golden gargoyles, and that is all King Galaros was to Zania, a large, gruesome gargoyle. Galaroth relaxed his grip, his power releasing Zania's neck. <laughs> Impressed, he asked, assuming that she was. And imagine, all this could be yours. He then dropped to his knees in front of her. All of it. And all you have to do is tell me where that blasted blade is. Zania fell into a deep thought as she considered the consequences of her decision. On one hand, if she revealed the location, who's to say that Galaroth would not honour his promise and just kill her and Marlon, and then millions more? On the other, if she didn't reveal the location, Galaroth would have to keep her alive. But she feared he would use Marlon as leverage and torment her for the rest of her days. No, she decided, Marlon would have to be sacrificed in order to save the rest of humanity. Well, will you defect to my side? Never, she cried. I will never be yours, and forget this measly mansion for even if you were to place the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left, even then I would have nothing to tell you about the blade. She steeled herself and looked into his eyes. You might as well kill me. Kill me now, for that is what you are, Galaroth, a murderer. Zania raised her hand to slap him, but his guards were quick to intercede. King Galaroth shook his head in disappointment. As he rose from his knees, he said, Foolish, ignorant ingrate. I did not want it to come down to this, but I'm afraid you have cost yourself your son. For he will be the first to die. Do you see that blue octopus reclining on that cloud over there? Marlon will be its next meal. So you had better talk. Or, I promise you, he will be between its jaws. Zania laughed. <laughs> Go ahead. I don't care. I sacrificed him in my heart the moment we were torn apart. You see, one can do extraordinary things with no remorse if God dwells within their heart. Are you listening to this, Marlon? Your mother is so madly in love with God that she wouldn't even shed a tear at your demise. And I have changed my mind, and I will spoil Marlon's Zania, for he will now reside with me. I'll make him into a mighty little murderer. Isn't that right, little Marlon? 
<laughs> he snarled as Marlon began to cry. You will do no such thing. My Marlon will never become a murderer, for he is an angel. Exalt the almighty Marlon. He is our only hope now. Galaroth waved his hand and the guards grabbed Zarnia by her elbows. They dragged her away, her heels scraping the floor as she writhed and screamed for her son, whose head was now hooked in Galaroth's arm. <laughs> yes, I thought that would be worse than killing your son. But worry not. I shall raise him like a dog, and have him ruin the rest of this earth in your name. And what did you mean, ephemeral empire? Galgangstinople will live as long as this earth endures, and if the good die young, then I am sure to live forever. And just you wait and watch, he went on to threaten. I will literally lift the whole of Dicentia with my mental might, and then cast you maggots into the blazing bowels of the earth. <laughs> he thundered. He then called out to the guards, dragging her away. Let her rot in our deepest, darkest hole, where even the cockroaches are disgusted to go. We will see how long it takes for that to change her tune. <laughs> he laughed loudly. And if that does not work, I have other ways of making you mine. <laughs> he began to laugh then, louder and louder, until the elephantine double doors did little to contain his maniacal laughter from escaping the courtyard. Mother! When Orion opened his eyes, the truth of his shattered family was made clear to him. He pulled the blanket over his head and sobbed softly. He found some comfort in the brief sanctuary he found there, hiding from the world and all its awful truths. Perhaps it was just an awful dream, an awful, long, long dream. He sat upright in bed, his body drenched in sweat. Around him the room was dark, a coolness pervaded the air. He felt fear in his soul, as premonition gripped him, telling him that something tremendous was to happen that night. He turned toward the window. He could see that the deepest night was past. If his premonition was right, whatever was to happen would happen soon. He remained still as a deer in a clearing, thin shafts of moonlight seeping in through the cracks in the shutters. It was all so silent, so eerily silent. And then, suddenly, a squall burst open the door of his room. The wind howled and ran in circles like a whirlwind. When the gale died down, a wisp of smoke, the colour of pearl-white clouds, remained. He kept his eye on the smoke, as a beaming, translucent apparition took shape, illuminating the entire room like a large lantern. Although it seemed a frightening apparition, he did not feel frightened. Pensive, yes. Uncertain, yes. But not frightened. And then his emotions lightened, and a smile took form on his lips. In that light was the image of of his beloved father's noble face. Orion tried to speak, but found he was unable. As he gazed at the glorious image, his father's voice filled the room. Orion, my son, I bring you glad tidings from the afterlife. I heard you call God Almighty that night at the funeral pyre. I was correct in assuming that the defect in the Dicentian blade was a result of the gods being concerned over how much power it contained. Yet they saw how bravely I died, and as a result have revealed to me many of their secrets. They have imbued the Dicentian blade 
with powers of their own. It now rests soundly in a piece of stone in King Hemlington's castle, as I had originally planned. The person who wields it must first prove himself worthy. If you are to be this person, the strength you need can be found only in Mount Apocalypse. It is there that you will undergo testing. The three gods of this universe and beyond dwell on the zenith and guard the power you need. The god of evil, Jilic Apocalypse, the goddess of good, Serenade Apocalypse, and the lord of all creation, Lord Trinigan Apocalypse, who is the crown and trophy of the Timeless Kingdom, will descend from the heavens to meet you there. If you prove yourself to this trio, they will give you the power to wield the Dissentian Blade. Mount Apocalypse is far from here, on a remote island off the coast of the lands of Galeria itself. After you have completed 18 years on this earth, you will be ready at any midnight after that day. Stand on the summit of Kirochu Island with only your weapons. You will travel to Mount Apocalypse in a celestial sphere that will provide you with nourishment and rest during your long journey. The gods will be expecting you. His father's voice then seemed to grow weary and emotional. I have given you all I can, my son. The rest is up to you. With that, Joratan's light faded away and his voice went silent. Orion remained unmoving, stunned by what had just occurred. His heart was erupting with emotion. He had seen his father again. He had heard his voice. That blessing would have been more than he could understand. But the message his father brought was even more incredible. How could it be, he wondered, that I am so special that Lord Trinigan Apocalypse himself sent the spirit of my father to guide me. At that moment, with that realization, he was so suffused with joy that the light within him could have lit up the room like his father's image. He looked up and smiled at the ceiling with an expression of absolute joy and humility. How long he remained in that prayerful posture he did not know, but what he did know was what he had to do next. However, he would have to be patient. He was not yet strong enough. He had been unable to so much as pull that axe from the tree. He would have to bide his time and be patient and brave. You too must be patient and brave, mother, Orion whispered into the cold night air.